Hello everyone, from our first episode, we learned that the soldiers of the 12th Indian Army Brigade came face to face with the Japanese armoured tanks rolling down Chua Chukang Road. Not having any anti-tank support at the time, they chose to withdraw to Bukit Panjang village. During the invasion of Singapore, the Japanese 25th Army was supported by their third tank group which comprised the first 6 and 14 tank regiments. The tanks that were used in Singapore were mainly of two types. The 16-ton Type 97 Chi Ha medium tank used by the 1st and 6th regiment and the light 8-ton Type 95 Hago infantry support tank used by the 14th tank regiment. Type 97 Chi Ha medium tank Manufacturer Mitsubishi Heavy Industries, Japan. Weight 16 tons. Crew 4 men. Armor 25mm riveted hull. Armaments 157mm main gun. Two 7.7mm machine guns. Power plant Mitsubishi V12 diesel 170 HP. Maximum speed 38km per hour. Type 95 Hago Light Infantry Support Tank Manufacturer Mitsubishi Heavy Industries, Japan Weight 8 tons Crew 3 men Armor 12 to 15 mm steel plate Armaments 157 mm main gun 1 7.7 mm machine gun Power plant Mitsubishi Diesel 120 HP Maximum speed 45 km per hour the British Army tactic in Malaya at the time was on the premise of keeping the line of communication open. This meant not only being able to communicate orders, but also keeping the road open in case of necessary movements, movement of troops to advance or if necessary to retreat, and for the movement of weapons and vehicles. Thus, the defence line was always one of depth with the enemy having to pass through a long string of defenders rather than that of a broad front. This tactic was seen during the fight at Bulim, Lam San, Kiat Hong and now at Bukit Panjang. And so it was that the 12th Indian Brigade's plan to protect the road to Bukit Timah was to space each regimental unit along the 2 km stretch from Bukit Panjang to Dairy Farm on the eastern side of Bukit Timah Road. The 29th Australian Battalion was stationed at the junction with Chua Chu Kang Road. They would be the vanguard of the defence line being formed. Here, their B Company had successfully stopped the first two tanks with their boys' anti-tank rifles, which momentarily halted the Japanese armoured column. Boys anti-tank rifle, manufacturer BSA England. Type Bolt Action Light Anti-Tank Infantry Support Weapon Ammunition Magazine Fat 5 Rounds 0.55 Inch Cartridge Effective Range 500 Yards Weight 15.6 Kg Unfortunately, the boy's anti-tank rifle was ineffective against the Japanese medium tanks which comprised more than half of all the tanks landed in Singapore. The Australian 29 Battalion at the north end of the village also had the task to watch for Japanese forces that might come down from Woodlands Road. The Hyderabads, who were badly mauled the day before at Hill 156, were placed at a section further south from the Australians. They occupied the Chenghua Chinese School as a fuel aid station, as they had many casualties, but would eventually evacuate themselves together with the Australian 29 Battalion before the fight began at Bukit Panjang.
the Argyle and Sutherland Regiment had their A and D companies positioned about 500 metres further down the road in the rubber estate between the village and St. Joseph Church. The Royal Marines from B and C Company would be positioned between St. Joseph Church and the Public Works Depot at the junction of the dairy farm track. The units were all positioned roughly 100 metres away from the road, with the area in between being the killing ground. In front of these two sections, they constructed roadblocks. Bukit Panjang village was by then completely devoid of residents, who had all fled or had evacuated to Singapore city for safety from the hostilities. Thus, the defending soldiers were able to use the village huts and compounds to set up their line. In the event of a loss of communication among the units, the backup plan was to make their way to the rendezvous point, the RV, which was the cold storage dairy farm at the northern foothills of Bukit Timah Hill, the highest point in Singapore, there to regroup before returning to base at Tyersel Camp. There were four escape routes that the various units could take. These easy routes all led to the water pipeline at the rear. These were Jalan Fajar, Jalan Gangsa, Chestnut Drive and Dairy Farm Road. As the pipeline ran directly into Dairy Farm, it would be the best means of getting to the RV. However, this was also a fact known to the Japanese. Earlier the day before, the Jin Infantry Battalion had already arrived at Bukit Panjang and had taken up a position at the base of Bukit Gombak. The Jin Battalion was part of Fortress Singapore, the defence establishment for Singapore City, but their main task was airfield protection, and so they were assigned to Tenga Airfield. At the time of the invasion, the Jin Battalion was only at half strength with two infantry companies and a support platoon. They were led by their commander, Lieutenant Colonel Gerbash Singh, affectionately called Gearbox Singh by his men. When Tenga Airfield was captured by the Japanese, the Jin Battalion was reassigned by the Australian Field Commander, Brigadier Taylor, to a rear guard position at Bukit Gomba. There, they were to prevent a possible enemy infiltration route to Bukit Timah. This was at the village of Tuasuabu, which was located in a small valley between the summits of Bukit Gombak and Bukit Panjang. When the 12th Indian Brigade arrived at Bukit Panjang and was repositioned to defend the road to Bukit Timah, the Jin Battalion, who were on the western side of the road, were relieved from their station. Colonel Gearbox Singh decided to return his unit to base, but not having any transport vehicles, they had to march the 14 kilometers back to the city. What happened next to the Jin Battalion after this moment has been a bit of a mystery. We know that they did not report back to base by the time Singapore surrendered. The leading theory behind their disappearance was that Colonel Gearbox Singh held his battalion at the Hume Pipes factory, three kilometers down from Bukit Panjang, probably to continue their journey at first light in the morning due to difficulties in moving a battalion in the dark. The Hume factory, which was located beside the Ford Motor factory, was overran by the Japanese forces that very night in their push to attack Bukit Timah village. There is a well-publicized Japanese war newsreel that shows British Indian Army soldiers being captured and surrendering at the Hume Pipes factory. Was this the Jin Battalion being filmed surrendering? We will explore this theory in a future episode. Back at Bukit Panjang on the moonless night of 10 February, it was pitch black with the only source of light coming from the flickering flames of the burning oil tanks and Mandai Estate about a mile away north at Woodlands Road. 
It was so dark that soldiers could not see their own outstretched hand in front of them, much less any approaching Japanese soldiers. During the night, having recovered from losing the first two tanks in the column, the Japanese began sending troops and tanks probing the village and the road towards Bukitima village. The lead tank had even made its way right to the 12th Brigade HQ at the PW depot before the British realized the intrusion. The tank opened fire, damaging parts of the depot before being attacked by the defenders, including the Brigade Commander Brigadier Paris himself. The lead tank then slid back into the darkness from where it came. They were surprised that a rogue tank could have made it all the way down to the Dairy Farm Junction undetected, passing through both the Australian 29th Battalion and the Hyderabads without being alerted. It was then discovered that both the Australians and the Hyderabads had on their own decided to retreat without informing HQ. They had proceeded to withdraw via the pipeline earlier and thus left the junction and the village unguarded. This in effect left the 12th Indian Brigade with only the four companies of the Plymouth Argyle, a force of less than 400 men, to confront the Japanese 42nd Infantry Regiment and their 6th Tank Regiment. With that, the Argyles decided to fortify both their roadblocks with anti-tank mines. The first roadblock was where the A and D company was stationed. The second roadblock was just after St. Joseph Church, which was manned by B and C companies. These blockades were meant to slow the advance of the Japanese tanks and allow the Argyles to pick off the Japanese infantry soldiers accompanying the tanks. As the Japanese regiments began to filter down the road, it became a slow battle of attrition due to the darkness, with the opposing forces on either side of the road cowering in the roadside monsoon ditches and returning small arms fire, grenades and mortar shelling. Colonel Masanobu Serji, the Japanese 25th Army Chief Operations Staff Officer and Tactical Planner, recounted his observations of the battle at Bukit Panjang. We arrived at a three road junction. It was immediately after the attack. Our men and wounded enemy were lying where they had fallen, mixed with each other, calling and groaning in pain. Destroyed enemy trucks blocked the road in many places. It was difficult to pass through them. One of the Japanese tanks was disabled by an anti tank mine at blockade but the roadblock was soon cleared aside by the other tanks coming down. The Argyle's armoured Lanchester cars were soon put out of action. Lanchester 6x4 armoured car Type turreted armoured car for reconnaissance and scout missions. Crew 4 men Armour 9mm steel plates on sides and front. Armament 1 0.5 inch Vickers heavy machine gun and 2 0.303 inch Vickers machine gun. Powered by Lanchester 6 cylinder patrol engine 90 HP. Weight 7 tons. Maximum speed 72 km per hour. Colonel Stewart estimated that there were now between 50 to 75 tanks in the long column inching precariously towards Bukit Tima in the dark. Their delays at the two Bukit Panjang roadblocks had given the British forces at Bukit Tima village enough time to set up a third roadblock just outside Bukit Tima village. This final roadblock was equipped with sufficient anti-tank guns which managed to halt the tank column and thus delaying the attack on Bukit Tima village. The Japanese armoured column was denied before Bukit Tima village and their single column backed up all the way from there to Bukit Panjang. Colonel Seward had by then, in view of his remaining resources, decided that they would lie in Doggo and wait until daybreak before picking off the infantry that accompanied the tanks. However, in the early hours of the 11th, 
the Japanese sent two companies of infantry soldiers through the rubber estate to flush out the enemy Argals who were harassing the tank column. Advancing exactly between the four Plymouth Argyle Company positions where St. Joseph Church was located, the Japanese patrols started picking off the various sections of the Plymouth men. With heavy Japanese infiltration into their sector, Colonel Stewart decided that the best option was to retreat back to base via the planned dairy farm route. A and D Company were now cut off by the Japanese infantry spearhead into the rubber plantation. So Brigadier Paris withdrew ahead with B and C Company towards the pipeline. Regimental Sergeant Major Manop had gone round the various Argyle's position and called out, OK lads, every man for himself. Get to the rendezvous point now, or back to base at Tyersall any way you can. Every man for himself. Normally, you would think this phrase as somewhat being selfish. Don't be too concerned about others, just look out for yourself. But in military terms, it has a slightly different connotation. Every man for himself is sounded when a commander finds the situation they are in as being totally hopeless. Do what you can on your own to stay alive. Once this call is given, some rules of military disciplines are suspended. The soldier can decide on his own under those circumstances, either to continue to fight or to escape, to retreat or even to surrender. But he knows he can no longer get any support from his own unit or fellow comrades. He is entirely on his own and here at Dairy Farm, the call went out to the Plymouth Argyles on the morning of the 11th February 1942. I'm standing at what was once the old pasture land of the former dairy farm at Bukit Timah. The Royal Marines B and C companies were just in front in the distance there. The road from Bukit Panjang to Bukit Tima is about 500 meters in the distance. Over there, you can just about make out the steeple of the old St. Joseph Church, beyond which the Argyles A and D Company were positioned among the rubber trees. Unfortunately, A and D Companies were in a very bad situation as the Japanese patrols were then moving between their position and the battalion rendezvous point here at Dairy Farm. Colonel Stewart waited till daybreak for A and D Company to turn up, but they failed to appear, and so the rest had to make a fighting retreat as Japanese soldiers began to arrive at Dairy Farm as well. At this time, it was no longer tenable for the depleted Argyles and Sutherland Regiment to stand and fight the battalions of Japanese infantry on their aggressive push towards Bukit Timah. The Japanese 11th Infantry Regiment were at the rear. The 21st and 22nd Regiments with the 6th Tank Regiment were at the front and they were caught in the middle. Whereas the Japanese 42nd Regiment accompanied by their Tank Regiment would fight their way down Upper Bukit Timah to Bukit Timah Village the Japanese 11th Regiment, the other component of the Japanese 5th Division, was to manoeuvre through Bukit Panjang Village to the pipeline and from there to advance to Bukit Timah Hill in a wide flanking movement in the trust to capture Bukit Timah. 
In their attack along the pipeline, the 11th Regiment came across many of the retreating Argals and Sutherland soldiers, mostly those from A and D companies. It was there that 12 soldiers from Platoon 18 of D Company, led by Sergeant BT, were captured. The captured soldiers were then brought to the dairy farm location, which was by then overran by the Japanese regiment heading to Bukitima Hill. While Bukitima village and the high summit was being captured, for the next two days, the 12 captive soldiers at Dairy Farm were brutally tortured and subjected to cruel beatings and punishment by their captors. They were all tied up with barbed wire to further excruciate their pain. The 12 Argo prisoners were singled out for retribution by the Japanese soldiers for the death of their comrades killed at Bukit Panjang and Chua Chukang. After two days of torture, they were finally killed by bayonet stabbing, with one soldier, Private Davidson, being shot as well. Private McLaughlin was stabbed through his throat. The 12 bodies were taken to a nearby stream and dumped into a ditch and left to rot. However, unknown to the Japanese captors, two of the soldiers did not die immediately. Sergeant B.T. and Private Hugh Anderson had survived the multiple stab wounds and were still barely alive after being thrown into the ditch. Private Anderson, who himself was stabbed six times, heard Sergeant B.T. groaning and told him to play dead so that they might by a miracle somehow survive the ordeal. However, Sergeant B.T. succumbed to his wounds later that night. Although details are scant, Private Anderson was rescued by a Chinese farmer who lived in the area. Even up to now, the identity of this farmer has been unknown. There were even speculations that he might have been part of the resistance. Private Hugh Anderson was tended in secret by the farmer for three months until his wounds healed. It was then that the Chinese farmer undertook to smuggle Private Anderson into Changi Jail, where many of the Allied prisoners of war were incarcerated. How this was done has never been detailed. When Private Anderson was interviewed by his superiors at Changi Jail, the events of the massacre of the Argyle soldiers unfolded. However, to prevent the Japanese jailers from finding out that there was a living eyewitness to an atrocity committed by the Japanese, Private Anderson was ordered to keep it a secret. This was for his own safety, but in a close, confined place, the secret was a difficult thing to keep, and soon talk had spread and the massacre was known amongst the British soldiers. To prevent Private Anderson from being seized or interrogated by the Japanese jailers, Private Anderson was moved to a POW work camp at Thompson Road, away from Changi Jail. And ironically, to keep him alive, he was put into one of the first batches of POWs to be sent to Thailand in October 1942 to work on the building of the dreaded Thai Burma Railway, the infamous Death Railway. <laughs>